I do teach entrepreneurship at the school, uh, which Peter Klein brings up, whether or not it could be taught by a professor. I think another question is whether or not it can be learned. Um, <laughs> however, in the literature, they do distinguish between the art and science of entrepreneurship, and we usually don't question whether or not management or doctors or lawyers, physicians, uh, whether that can be taught. But for some reason, entrepreneurship is questioned. But if you distinguish between the art and science, I think it's a lot easier to think that the science of entrepreneurship, and I won't go into that, but actually can be taught. Uh, my co-author here is Mark Thornton, whom you probably know from the Mises Institute, and he's a real scholar in this area, so uh, he'll be available for questions as well after this. Now, our topic is on how entrepreneurship theory created economics, and we're really going back to the first economist and entrepreneur, millionaire, that developed a full theory of economics and entrepreneurship, which is Richard Cantillon. Just by a show of hands, how many of you have heard of Richard Cantillon? Okay, we're in a good crowd here. How many of you have actually read Cantillon? Okay, great. For those that haven't, I highly recommend it. It, it uh, pays really well. It pays off really well. It's uh, quite rewarding, I mean. And the book here is here in the bookstore. Now, many people, many economists, of course, were, were the exception maybe, think that economics, as, as Rothbard wrote, would spring from the uh, brow of Zeus, the Zeus being Adam Smith, right? And uh, he has a quote on this in his History of Economic Thought. Uh, he says, The honor of being called the father of modern economics belongs then not to its usual recipient, Adam Smith, but to a gallicized Irish merchant, banker, and adventurer who wrote the first treatise on economics more than four decades before the publication of The Wealth of Nations. Cantillon is quoted in, in Adam Smith's book, which is quite unique in that way. So looking at some of Cantillon's contributions of the entire essay, uh, he goes into spatial economics, which has to do with geography and area, uh, population theory, things like that. He does talk about business cycle, and he's quite Austrian in his formation of the uh, formulation of the business cycle. In terms of methodology, he's also quite Austrian. He uses individualism, a subjectivist approach, and he creates these abstractions and theoretical constructs that he uses. Looking at the book here, it's basically three parts. I'm just going to give you a quick overview here. So you can see part one. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of these, but kind of see what he talks about. And here he develops his theory of the entrepreneur pretty much from the beginning. And then he goes into more barter, money, market prices. And then he has a section at the end on foreign trade, international monetary relations. And on this, I wanted to read a quote by, Je by uh, Jevons. And he says, this third part especially is almost beyond praise and shows that Richard Cantillon had a sound and pretty complete comprehension of many questions about which pamphleteers are still wrangling and blundering and perplexing themselves and other people. <laughs> Rothbard has a lecture on this, which is on the Mises.org, which he talks about the Whig theory of history and, and how some people believe that... You know, that between science and time, there's sort of a, a positive relationship, and this, of course, is, is not the case that uh, we see from mainstream economics. That not only is it, do they not learn from Cantillon, but they've actually uh, taken backward steps. Uh, Jevons goes on to say, the essay is more than a mere essay or even collection of disconnected essays like those of Hume. It is a systematic and, con systematic and connected treatise going over in a concise manner near the, nearly the whole field of economics with the exception of taxation. Possibly a good thing, right? Uh, it is thus more than any other book I know, the first treatise on economics. Sir William Petty's Political Arithmetic and his Treatise of Taxes and Contributions are wonderful books in their way, and at their time, but compared with Cantillon's Asai, they are mere collections of casual hints. There were earlier English works of great merit, such as those of Vaughan, Locke, Child, Munn, etc., but these were either occasional essays and pamphlets or else fragment, fragmentary treatises. Cantillon's essay is more emphatically than any other single work the cradle of political economy. Okay, now I want to go into 
the actors in Cantillon's economy in the market. Okay, we've got landowners, and these are basically the people that uh, create demand. So whatever their desires, whims, wishes, uh, the fashion trends of the day, they're created by these landowners. It's not so important that it's actually the landowners or the property owners, but that it's that demand is created. Okay, and then you've got wage laborers, which are basically just distinguished by whether or not they're on a fixed income or salary, a fixed wage. And finally, the, the central actor is the entrepreneur, simply distinguished as being on unfixed income. We'll see the implications of that. So the entrepreneur responds to the demand created by the landowners. They conduct all production, uh, circulation, and even exchange. So entrepreneurs are, are exchanging one with another in the marketplace. Okay, and this goes into the discussion that uh, Stuart kind of brought up here, risk and uncertainty. Okay, Cantillon has quite a bit to say about this. Now, the entrepreneur, one of our arguments in the paper is the entrepreneur is very pervasive throughout the treaties. Okay, uh, he talks about the farmer entrepreneur sort of taking the, getting the, getting the uh, material or the product from the land, from the landowner. So farming that and then selling that to a manufacturer who is on, also an entrepreneur based on the uh, unfixed income, okay? Of course, the entrepreneur, the farmer entrepreneur doesn't know the future selling price, which creates uncertainty. So uncertainty is because of the presence of time. Now, Mises has said that uncertainty is inherent in human action, right? It burdens every actor. So all of us have to deal with time and make decisions uh, based on our perception of the future, based on judgment and whatnot. However, what distinguishes this is the entrepreneur is trying to forecast the future selling price, right? Hopefully above his or her cost of production. So manufacturer entrepreneur then sells to the middleman entrepreneur who's going to bear the cost of, of transporting the goods. And then, you know, on down the line until the product is exchanged with the consumer. So from production to consumption, Again, the manufacturer entrepreneur has to sell the product. They're selling at an uncertain future price based on their certain cost, which again is just uncertainty all the way through because of the presence of time. Because of that, there's a profit or a loss, okay, which is a risk. What's the risk? Well, bankruptcy or starvation. Now, uh, Stuart kind of brought up objective or subjective risk, and I don't know if I'm characterizing you correctly, but but if we were, if we had to choose between subjective or, or objective, I think that might be the wrong question. I'm not saying that's what you were saying, but um, it's a dichotomous question, right? And and I think there's a danger in that. Uh, subjective risk, if we wanted to call it that, might be, you know, are they going to be able to? What do they want to eat, right? Pizza or a salad or whatnot. But objective risk, you know, are they going to eat at all? Well, that's pretty objective, right? Because you're risking death. Same with bankruptcy, you know. Subjective risk might be how much profit they want to make uh, versus objective risk, whether or not they make it at all. So more measurable. Anyway, compare this with Schumpeter's entrepreneur, probably the most well-known entrepreneur, uh, theory of the entrepreneur. And we could compare it to a violin, okay? So he's got what he calls, Schumpeter has what he calls the circular flow of economic life. Everything's pretty much in equilibrium, uh, and kind of like the violin strings are not resonating, so they're flat, right? And then along comes the entrepreneur, which acts as the, I believe that's called a bow or whatever, and strums it, right? And everything starts to vibrate and kind of get out of whack, but then it all starts to settle back down again. So the entrepreneur comes along, disrupts the existing equilibrium through one of these five method, w methods here, which uh, Schumpeter calls new combinations. I'm not going to go into those, but... Uh, Schumpeter departed from his teacher, Baum Bavrik, who associated the entrepreneur with the capitalist. So they were one and the same. The entrepreneur had to bear risk because he was the capital owner. Schumpeter said that even though the entrepreneur may risk his reputation, much less any financial capital, because Schumpeter distinguished between the two, the direct responsibility of failure never falls on him. So it's quite different from Cantillon's. Uh, in addition, we, we could uh, talk about Schumpeter's creative destroyer, creative destruction that he talks about. So if we imagine 
Uh, Victorian England, there's the horse and buggy, right? And everything's just fine again in the circuit flow of economic life. Along comes the entrepreneur, creates a car, right? Distorts everything just like the violin, to mix metaphors here. Uh, what What is important about this is Schumpeter's entrepreneur is only acting as an entrepreneur in creating the new good or the new source of supply or the new market. So Henry Ford, once he stopped doing this, right, and production just kind of continued, but once he had invented the car, he stopped being an entrepreneur. So same with Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. Uh, there were entrepreneurs, but now they just become managers of existing companies, and they're no longer doing one of the five things that Schumpeter considers as uh, entrepreneurship. Contrast this with Cantillon's pervasive entrepreneur. Here He mentions the uh, word entrepreneur over 110 times in the, the treaties. He considers tailors entrepreneurs, artists or painters, all because of uncertainty. They're all on unfixed incomes. Bakers, uh, restaurateurs, or however you pronounce that, people that own their own restaurant or retail stores, carpenters, uh, shoemakers, butchers, physicians, right? <laughs> um, he even considers beggars and robbers entrepreneurs because of uncertainty, unfixed income. So our argument in the paper is basically Cantillon uses his theory of entrepreneurship and he creates these theoretical constructs which he uses to construct economic theory. Okay, so without the theory of entrepreneurship, all of his theoretical constructs pretty much fall apart. One of these, just to go into this, and there's more examples in the paper, has to do with spatial economics and location theory. So Cantillon talks about market towns where buyers and sellers come together. They, there's exchange and there's various advantages to having a market town where all exchange takes place. Outside of that, there's a village. Entrepreneurs locate around the village to re reduce transportation costs and to travel to the market town. Uh, Cantillon says, in the village, um, there must be enough blacksmiths and wagon makers for the tools, plows, and carts that are needed, especially when the village is far from the town. The size of a village is naturally proportioned to the number of inhabitants the land requires for daily work and to the artisans who find enough employment there by serving the farmers and laborers. Uh, finally, there's the city, which is where the landowners locate. So if enough princes and nobles and lords come together, they form a city. Okay, just to conclude here. So... One key takeaway, entrepreneurship is pervasive, right? There's no restriction really on the entrepreneur other than being on an unfixed income, which implies uncertainty, which leads inextric inextricably to risk, being bankruptcy or starvation, or even talks about risk in the form of an opportunity cost of what you could earn uh, other than going into business on your own type of thing. So these theoretical constructs are based on the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is, is central, right? Entrepreneurial actions, entrepreneurial plans, they take place uh, uh, spatially and, and temporally, okay? So one of the implications, of course, is in mainstream economics, the entrepreneur is pretty much removed from the models, or if it is, the entrepreneurial function is given a measurable degree of risk, and that risk is equally distributed among all entrepreneurs in the model. So we argue that it will become much more exciting uh, and relevant to both entrepreneurship and ec economics if the entrepreneur is fundamental and, and central as the actor that coordinates production, circulation, exchange of goods. Thank you very much.